You're listening to Travel Tales with Virgil. Overarching, uh, you know, excitement and and love of life, uh, you know, no matter what it was. So that that could be a really beautiful thing to witness. It was very, very charismatic and compelling to be around. You know, it made you feel that. And somebody says this in the book too. He made things seem better than they were. He made you excited about what you were all doing together. You know, he was very good at sort of、uh, manifesting that、uh, that enthusiasm for life.、Uh, I think that it does answer questions. I think it does sort of. Show people a more complete picture of who he was, what his struggles were, what his、uh, his extreme fragility and his weaknesses. And I think that if you read the book, you will, I, I believe, have a greater understanding of how someone who seemed to have the perfect life could still get to a place where they feel、uh, so desperate as to as to end that life. Hello, I'm Fergal O'Keefe, and you're very welcome to the podcast. You just heard the voice of Laurie Wooliver there, who was the assistant for many years to the legendary Anthony Bourdain, and Laurie has just released a brilliant new biography on Anthony. I have a very special episode today celebrating the life of Tony, with interviews with Patrick Redden Keefe from the New Yorker magazine, who has written the definitive profile of Bourdain, and who was with him in Vietnam when he interviewed Barack Obama. And finally, we will hear from Paddy Daly. Who was the Irish producer whenever we recorded in Ireland? They give a fascinating insight into a global star who appeared to have it all. Anthony Bourdain was the author of Kitchen Confidential and the host writer of the seminal food and travel series Parts Unknown. He introduced us to entire cultures, places, and foods. By the time of his untimely death in 2018, Tony opened up new countries and places to us through his celebration of food and travel. And inspired us to go and explore the world. I really discovered the brilliance of Anthony Bourdain during the first lockdown when I started to rewatch his show Parts Unknown on Netflix to get my armchair travel fix when the world was closed. He actually inspired me to do this podcast series. One of my favourite things to do when I'm travelling is to sit outside a cafe, sample some local cuisine, and just watch the world go by. Bourdain would often do just that on his shows, and he could brilliantly convey the emotions attached to that experience. Bourdain brought the streets and markets alive, and you could practically smell the food. My first guest now is Patrick Redden Keefe, who is a staff writer with the New Yorker magazine. Patrick is the author of a number of best-selling books, including last year the award-winning Empire of Pain, which was about the Sackler family. Purdue Pharma and oxytocin. Patrick spent a year hanging out with Tony in New York and Vietnam, and interviewed many friends and family for the definitive profile of Anthony Bourdain. And now we're going to have a chat about that article and about his experiences with Tony. A chef turned writer and television host, Anthony Bourdain had designed a fantasy existence, traveling around the world. Budget be damned! Meeting interesting people and eating delectable food, and you also said journalism can occasionally afford an opportunity for vicarious living. So when you did your profile、uh, for the Yorker, brilliant profile, I have to say, on Anthony Bourdain a few years ago, you got to do that. You got to see some of that lifestyle.、It、must have been amazing, was it? Yeah, it was wonderful. I mean, it came at a、um, it came at a strange time for me. I had written some very dark. Pe- Pieces for the magazine. I'd written a piece about the Boston Marathon bombing, and a piece about、um, the the disappeared from the troubles in Northern Ireland, and a piece about、uh, the Lockerbie bombing back in the eighties. In in succession, and my editor said, "You know, you seem a bit burned out. What would you? What would be your fantasy assignment?" And I said, "I'd love to get to travel with Anthony Bourdain," and、um, uh, proposed it to him. I didn't know if he would go for it because he'd been written about so much at that point already. But he did, and we had this kind of fun process of getting to know each other in New York, and then figuring out where I would go with him.、Um, there was like a there was a moment there where it looked like we might go to Burma, and we talked about maybe going to South America, and then I got the call saying, "No, let's do Vietnam. It's got to be Vietnam." And when you got that, did you know that he was going to be meeting Obama then in Vietnam? 
I didn't know. And they kept it completely secret. And it was one of these funny things, I think because of the kind of secret service protocol, they couldn't tell me. And I, they were clearly withholding something from me. I knew that there was something they weren't telling me. Um, and I was getting kind of pissed off, to be honest with you, because they were just being a little squirrely about when and where I'd meet him. And I was thinking, I'm flying all the way to Hanoi. You know, you've got to give me a time and a place here. Um, and then as soon as I got off the plane and turned my phone on in Hanoi, I had these texts and they said, now we can tell you <laughs> he's meeting with Obama. And actually, I think that could well be my favorite episode because it kind of summed up everything about the program, you know, kind of yeah. you know, meeting guests, you know, out of context, relaxed. You get to know the person through food, kind of summed everything up. I thought perfectly that little piece with Obama. I think that's right. And I think they they um, you know, I said it in the piece, but I think in some ways they shared a, they shared a philosophy in a way. And I think that part of what made it um, so acute, probably for both of them in a way, is that this was happening against the backdrop of, you know, the ascendancy of Donald Trump. Right. That the, the kind of internationalism and the sort of openness um, you know, the idea that, that, that as an American, you could be a citizen of the world, that, that, that's not sort of nationalistic chest thumping. Um, I, I, I think that they had a, they, the two men shared a philosophy and at that moment when they're sitting down, you know, it was a philosophy that in some ways was, was, um, endangered. Yeah. It kind of shows the brilliance of Obama, I suppose, how we can get a message, you know, a subtle message out, isn't it? You know, like, it is, but it, but it also, but this is one of the funny things for me about Bourdain too, is that the, you know, it wasn't Bourdain's idea. Bourdain didn't call Obama and say, hey, let's get together. Yeah, Obama's yeah. people called Bourdain and said, he'd love to do the show. You know, he'd love to, to hang out, um, which I think really speaks to the man's influence. Yeah. And actually, I have another person on this podcast, Pat Daly, who worked with him in Ireland and he brought him to a pub in Dublin. And then a few years later, Michelle Obama went to the same pub. And yeah. he, he, he doesn't know, but he thinks it's probably because Bourdain went there. So then they yeah. went there. Just shows you the power. Oh, of I'm it. sure. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because he was very ambivalent about that because he there's a line in the piece where he, he, he told me something like, you know, what I do is I travel around the world and I go to these places and I find these wonderful undiscovered gems. And then I just I, you know, can I swear here? Of course. Can I yeah. swear on this? And then yeah. I fuck them up. I fuck them up because, <laughs> yeah. you know, what happens is that once I've done the show in the place, it's completely swamped by people, you know, ever, ever. And it's not just Americans, right? It's like tourists from all over the world used him as their, almost as their, their guidebook, right? Yeah. And Joe, it's funny. I read your article ages ago and then I reread it um, yesterday, actually. And I didn't realize that when you said, that that place, you only went back. I thought you went back to that months later. You know, no. that you, it was like a day or two later. Yeah, the, the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, and, and what was funny is, and the funny thing is, he had said to me, because he went to the place, he had the dinner, and then I told him just a day or two later, oh, I'm going to go back and and see see what's going on there now. And and he said he said almost wistfully, he was like, I wonder what it's like now. And when he said that, I thought, what are you talking about? It was just two days ago you went and had dinner there. And then I showed up and sure enough, it was totally transformed. You know, there was there were people taking selfies outside. There was a big, a big sign in the window saying we're sold out of food, you know, yeah. go away. Um, it was amazing to see that transformation. And as an aside, actually, I also read during the week, you've got a great book out at the moment called Empire of Pain about the Sackler family. Barack Obama, it was one of his recommended reads of uh, yeah, 2021. Yeah, I was so I was so delighted about that. Yes, he put it on his his list for the year. And were you there during that meal? Did you get to see that, or was that no? You know? So this is some of the the, the magic of uh, magazine journalism. I wasn't there. I got in. I got in basically as they were eating. I think so. I met up with Bourdain just an hour or two afterwards. And I there's a scene in the piece where I talk about him still. He's smoking a cigarette and he started smoking again. He's still really kind of vibrating from the meeting. But I wasn't there. The way I reconstructed it was that I got, it took some doing, but I got CNN to let me watch the raw footage. So they had all these cameras going for the whole meal. And then they obviously edited it down to about 10 or 12 minutes in the show. Um, 
but they let me come in. It was really under, it was, it was kind of under, virtually under armed guard. I had to go into the CNN headquarters. They put me in a room and they let me take notes and watch the raw footage of the whole thing. So that's the way I reconstructed that scene. And, you know, um, when you're doing an article like that, the profile, I'm just curious that, I mean, that was enough for an article there, just that trip. But you literally, you spent a full year yeah. meeting different people, constructing it. How does that, like, how do you decide that? Like, where my, my article is done now, I need to send yeah. it out. <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's you know, there aren't many places that, that give writers that kind of, um, that long a leash and that are willing to spend the money to to let us uh, kind of take the time that we do. It's one of the things I love about The New Yorker. And, and the goal, you know, the goal is to kind of write the definitive profile, right? That there's, with somebody like Anthony Bourdain who'd been profiled a thousand times before, um, it's quite a high bar at the point where you come in when the guy's been, you know, people have been writing about it for 20 years. Um, and, but one of the virtues of The New Yorker is that they give you the time so it's like I can, take the time to track down his first, you know, his ex-wife and, and, and talk to her. And I, I the, one of the things that I love about it is that when you spend time with somebody, you know, when it's not what it normally is in a newspaper or a magazine or TV, any kind of interview situation where you're doing a profile of somebody, you kind of parachute in, you know, you see them at the film junket, you interview them in a hotel room, um, you get the, you get a snapshot in time. And the nice thing about the, the kind of, big, robust New Yorker profile is that in the course of a year, things happen. And so, you know, in my case, it was this thing where I, I came in and, and Bourdain was actually, I think, I, you know, I, I subsequently realized in quite a dark place in his life and his marriage fell apart. You know, his, this was his second marriage to Ottavia. But when I started writing my piece at the beginning of the year, um, they certainly made it seem as though things were g great and they we were originally supposed to do an interview, the three of us together, and then they kept postponing it and they kept postponing it. And then eventually I met with just her. And then one day he, he wrote to me and said, hey, listen, I got to tell you, my, my marriage is over. Yeah, and, um, you know, like it was quite a seminal moment of his life, because when you read the article now, it probably wouldn't have been as obvious at the time. But now you read it. There was lots of hints to the darkness, yeah. wasn't there? Particularly, say, in France, you, you talk about yeah. him taking um, uh, an overdose, I suppose you could call it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a strange thing. You know, when I was, I mentioned before that I, <laughs> this was supposed to be, this assignment for me was supposed to be just mm. a, kind of a, a frolic in the park, you know, all fun and lightness. And, um, and about halfway through, I remember calling my editor in New York and saying, God, you know, this is this has gone pretty dark. This guy's in a pretty dark place. And I remember him telling me about this experience he had in France where he, he was really miserable and he was by himself and he took a bunch of well, kind of overdosed on medication and then, you know, drank a half a bottle of wine and passed out in a restaurant and thought he was going to die. And um, and he talked to me a lot about death. It was a thing that kind of kept recurring in our conversations. I, I don't mean to suggest, I mean, I had no idea, right? I didn't know how bad things were. And I also, he was in the beginnings of his relationship at that point at the final romantic relationship of his life. And I, I was sort of, I had a sense that that was happening, but I didn't know all the particulars. So there was a lot that I didn't know, but I certainly became aware as we went that this was somebody who was thinking a lot about, um, uh, you know, about mortality in his life and what it meant. Yeah. And you know, you use a lovely expression you wrote an article about him after, just after he died, I would say, and you said he was, you know, maybe you hadn't met anyone who was more volcanically alive, mm. you know? So he's someone that you could say had a fantasy job, was volcanically alive. I mean, even, you know, David Chappelle, I remember sort of did a bit of stand up at the time, which, you know, I, I, I usually like him, but I didn't like it. He sort of was taking the mick as in saying, comparing him to a dishwasher and ha having a wonderful life. And I think that is wrong because really every person you can't, you know, everyone, you can look at somebody and go, they have the perfect life, but that doesn't mean that they don't feel it themselves. I think that's right. I mean, I, I would almost put a finer point on it and say that I think for Tony on paper, he did have the perfect life and everywhere he went, people told him, you know, what a fantasy life, what a wonderful life you're living. 
And I think part of what was so maddening for him is that he wasn't happy, is that it didn't work. And and you can see how, um, you know, it's almost as if, if, if you've ever had insomnia, um, you, you can't fall asleep, you can't fall asleep, you're trying to fall asleep. And at a certain point, the fa- you're getting so stressed out about the fact that you can't sleep that, that the stress then keeps you awake for longer. You know, it's that the, I think it's sort of compounded his sense of alienation that, Everybody's constantly telling him, you must be so happy. You must be so happy. What a great life. What an enviable life. And he he knew objectively. Um, I mean, I think he even said to me in the piece, he said something like, if I've got it all, like if I'm not happy, it's it's my fault. Right. Um, but I think this is somebody who is dealing with a, a deep, deep depression. That's true. Actually, it was in, you mentioned about an episode in Sardinia where he said, what do you do after your dreams come true? I yeah. thought, you know. That kind of summed it up. But, you know, for for what was he like sort of off camera? Was he very mm. similar? Was he the same person or was he a different person? You, you, you described in the article about going, you were a few times you went out with him in New York. Well, he's I mean, it's funny if he was a performer. Um, and and so, you know, if you ever spend any time with um, certainly with actors or comedians or politicians, I think this is true of as well. It's not that they're, it's not Jekyll and Hyde. It's not that they're two different people when the cameras go on. It's more that I think it took a kind of um, a great reserves of energy to sort of play the person who was himself. It's not that that person was, was all that different from who he really was. It was more that it just, um, you know, you can imagine he's, he's jetting around the world. He's constantly, everywhere he goes, he's approached by people. This was one thing I, I noticed is that you go to a restaurant with him and this was true in Hanoi and it was true in New York City. People are just constantly coming up and it's the people who work in the restaurant. It's the other guests in the restaurant. People want their photos taken. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to have a conversation like you and I are. In the space of the conversation we've had, we would have been interrupted three or four times by somebody who kind of awkwardly comes over holding their phone and says, I'm so sorry to interrupt, would you mind? And he was very gracious about that, but you could see how over time it's kind of exhausting. And so I think what I was most struck by was that um, off camera, in person, he was quite shy, which is not what you would think. For somebody who's going out there in the world and meeting people all the time but there was a sense in which he would sort of um you could feel him kind of stepping back he becoming a bit more interior um and i wondered if that wasn't out of a kind of that he sort of needed to protect himself and sort of marshal his own resources because he knew that at a certain point the cameras are going to go on again and out of curiosity did he comment on your piece when it came out he did you know we had a um he didn't say much about it. I mean, I took I took it that he we stayed in touch and we kind of became friendly after that. And we did a there was a the New Yorker back in pre COVID times. So they would have a big festival every fall, and we did a wonderful Q and A for a huge crowd um, at a great venue in New York. And then we actually went out that night uh, to a party at a bar, and we closed the bar. My wife came, and we closed the bar down. It was great, um, and. Um, and then there was another thing he invited me to, and we would text. We sort of stayed in touch afterwards, which isn't always the case when I when I write about people. But about the piece specifically, he had said, we had a kind of email exchange where he, I just said something like, you know, I hope you see, I said, look, it's always awkward to read something like this about yourself. There's no way it, it wouldn't be, but I hope you see something of yourself in it. And um and he wrote back and said something like, yeah, you know, you, you could you could certainly say that, you know, yes, I do. I, I see myself in this. Absolutely. Excellent. And how would you describe him? Like, what is the magic that he has? Because, I mean, he's probably one of the biggest for travel and food. I would say maybe the biggest figure in the world, most influential, yeah. you know. So what is it? What's that magic that he had? I mean, I think some of it was a was a kind of. Um, was a sort of authenticity in his voice and an insistence that he was going to do things his way. And um, he changed. I mean, you know, one of the things that was interesting for me about what, about doing that piece and spending a year working on it was I was able to watch not every single episode he ever made, but I watched a lot of each of the diff- three different iterations of his show. And when you go back and you look at that first season, it's very, I mean, the, you know, going all the way back to a Cook's tour it's a very different kind of show. You know, it's a lot of gross out stuff. It's him sort of 
saying, oh my God, they eat this and will I eat it? And um, it's him, but it's, it's, you, you see him evolve in interesting ways. Um, no, I think some of it was just the authenticity of his voice and the kind of uncompromising nature. And then I also think that there's a, um, I think he had a genuine, unaffected curiosity in people and you see it. And I think that that's contagious and, um, uh, and I would also say, I, you know, I think, I think that's, I think that's humanity at its best. I think, for, I think, um, uh, you know, I think that people talk about watching his show in a kind of aspirational sort of lifestyle fantasy way. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get to travel the world and eat this food and do this stuff? But I also think that there was a underneath the kind of foul mouthed, you know, rock star pose of it all. Um, I think that there was a, a kind of benign, non-judgmental, just rapacious curiosity that he had. And, 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 I, and, and to me, at least, I can only speak for myself, I, I think that that's a quality I aspire to. I mean, I, I, think that that's a, um, I think that's something we should all strive for. And so I think getting to see these different parts of the world and meet these people and, and vicariously have these experiences with him as the guide, um, you know, where he's not an ugly American. He's sort of the very opposite of that. Uh, I think that that was a, 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 a magic formula. Exactly. Actually, when I started looking back at the older episodes, he wasn't afraid to be sort of, you know, the American who doesn't know everything as well, you know, like not afraid to say something silly or, yeah. you know, you know, and so that's that you have to be very secure to be able to do that or that's a bit of a gift. And also, say personally, what I like is that um, when I when I'm traveling, I love just sitting in a restaurant and watching everything going by. And that's yeah. kind of what that was a bit of was a lot of it was around tables and there mightn't have really been the conversation might, you know, mightn't have been very much even, or they hardly mentioned the food, but you're getting it all. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that the, I think that's a quality that got better and better with the show over the seasons. And I actually think that some of that is down to his collaborators as well. I mean, it was very much his vision, but it was one that um, his whole kind of traveling circus of collaborators, they, um, I mean, hearing you say that about the experience of travel, I think that's right. And I think when you watch the show, part of part of the magic of it is that sometimes it's just him standing on a beach or having a having a beer at a bar alone, watching people. And, you know, you have these moments that are that are almost silent, except for the music. Um, but you can feel that kind of wonderful experience of what it's like to travel to a foreign place. And you're kind of you're you're both inside it and outside it at the same time. So thank you. And it is definitely in the definitive account, I would say, I would encourage people. It's called Anthony, Bourd for Anthony Bourdain's Movable Feast, the New Yorker article. And I really recommend people. It's spectacular. But thank you. Yeah. And read and read his stuff. I mean, he, he wrote so much and there's there's so much. It's funny. I think people know him as a TV guy, but um, but obviously he was an incredible writer first and, and continued to write all the way through. That's what I keep saying to people, actually, you know, um, when I meet someone that don't know him, I always go, well, you know, the way you shouldn't eat fish on a Monday. That was him. You know, yeah. he, he's like some of his from that book, Kitchen Confidential. Oh, yeah, it's, gone into, it's gone into popular culture. It has. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah, he was great. And um, and uh, it's a great it's a great, great loss. But but nice that we can still talk about him and, and, and experience the work today. Exactly. Did you like him? Did you really enjoy his company? I did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I mean, he was, um, you know, it was a bit, I felt like I knew him before I knew him. Um, and then, uh, I think I was, when I, when I, when I really got to know him, I think what I was so struck by was just that he was very gentle and, and introspective in ways that were surprising to me. Um, and also if I, I forgot to mention that, um, you were actually in Laurie's book as well. You 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 contributed to that, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, and it's a wonder a wonderful book. I mean, I think it, it captures it captures so much. It was a, it was an honor for me to you know I it, it it's a little strange. You know, after he died, I got all these calls from journalists asking me about him. And of course, when you get to know somebody when you're writing a big profile of them, it's a very specific kind of thing. Like I wouldn't say that we were great friends. 
Um, there were big things I didn't know about. The strange thing about writing a profile of somebody, right, is that you're not lifelong friends. You sort of come in for a period of time, but then you're having these quite intimate conversations, right? I was asking him, I was really going for the jugular and asking him for, asking about his first marriage and, you know, the dark days of drug use and, and, you know, what he was really hoping for when he, in the early days when he was trying to be a writer and, and, um, kind of write his way out of the kitchen. And so there's a sort of, um, you know, it's almost like a therapist or something where you, 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 you don't know the person as well as their friends or their family know them at all. And it's a, it's a kind of time bounded thing, but the nature of the interaction is such that you have these like, quite intense, um, these quite intense, deep conversations about, about life. Um, and, um, so yeah, it's a strange thing. I mean, I was, I was honored to be included in the, in the book. And yet at the same time, many of the other voices in that book are people who knew him much, much better than I did. There was one thing in your article you sort of he, where he, you got him talking about, you know, he's not there for birthdays, and yeah. you know, you know, I know people very well. For in a way, that's describing him because he's saying I get to know people it's very true. well for a week. Yeah, and for a week that time. was that was you know that was very honest of him to say that. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, I think that made him it, it, for some people in his life that that was a difficult reality, right? Um, but. Uh, but yeah, but but look to the honesty. I mean, this was part of what was thr thrilling about writing about him is that sometimes you, as a journalist, sometimes you meet people. Um, I was I don't do sports writing, but I think this is probably the biggest danger in sports writing, is that you watch a you know you watch a basketball player or a soccer player do something amazing uh, on the on the court or on the pitch, um, and they're out there and they're just Mozart uh, with a ball. And then they get off and an interviewer sticks a microphone in their face and says, how was your experience with the game? And they say, oh, well, I just, well, you know, I had to bring it all and we, we did teamwork and it was great. And, you know, and it's, they're, they're very inarticulate. They can't really, they can't express the brilliance that they've just shown you. It's intuitive and it doesn't translate into their ability to narrate what they did. And occasionally as a journalist, you're lucky enough to meet somebody who's just very, very good at experience expressing their own um, art and and emotions. And Bourdain was one of those people, right? That the, he did a better job of sort of conveying what was happening with him than I ever could have. And that's a, you know, as a journalist, that's a gift when you, when you encounter somebody like that. Our next guest now is Laurie Williver, a brilliant and prolific US journalist who was Anthony Bourdain's lieutenant for many years. Her highly acclaimed book, Bourdain and Stories, is an oral history style collection of stories from Anthony's family, friends, crew, and TV colleagues. It reveals a vulnerable side to the man and adds remarkable depth to his on-screen persona. So your, your book, you know, the definitive oral history, I actually listened to it on, on audio. And it's actually a great way to, to listen to the book because mm -hmm. it is an oral history. So it was just fantastic. I absolutely loved it. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, really, really pleased with the way that, well, of course, very pleased with the book, but also the, the, um, the audio version. We were able to get almost everyone speaking their own parts uh, from yeah. the book, which was quite a feat. There are 91 different people who contribute their memories and their thoughts. Uh, and I think with the exception of about 10 people, everyone was was available and, and willing to uh, to do their reading. And for those who were not available, they hired <clears throat> very talented uh, voice actors. So, um, yeah, it's it's really I've been listening to it. In fact, I had I was uh, out of the city this weekend and I rented a car and I was listening to it while I was driving around. Wow. It's really a pleasure. And that must be that must be very emotional for you listening to it like then or. Yeah, well, you know, this is this is material that I've been engaging with for over three years. So, yes and no. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't punch me in the gut uh, the way that I think it might for people who are first coming to the book or coming to the audiobook. But uh, for sure, you know, there there are a lot of uh, nuances and subtleties and things I pick up uh, with each rereading or each re-listen, and uh, it really helps me. To process my own feelings about the the loss of Tony Bourdain, which was you know something that impacted me hugely, and 
And it helps me to uh, be empathetic to the reader and the listener and the family member and the, the fan. Uh, you know, Tony's death had a huge impact on, on a very large number of people. Were you surprised, actually? It was so many people. Yeah, yeah. Or at least, you know, a, a, a very vocal uh, percentage. Yeah. I, I was, uh, you know, I knew that Tony was very well known and well loved, but I, I, I was truly surprised by the initial outpouring of of grief in the wake of his death and uh, continue to be surprised and amazed uh, by the, the numbers of people that reach out even now and the interest around the world. You know, Tony was an American, his show was, was uh, produced by an American production company, uh, but the fact that he made an effort to travel to so many different places in the world really, I think meant a lot to a lot of people everywhere. So for instance, you have huge, interest well in Ireland of course uh, and and the UK and Australia New Zealand Canada India we've got a lot of fans there uh, and then other parts of, of the world where Tony went and really shone a light on uh, how people live who they are and what goes beyond the headlines and the the snapshots that we get from mass media it's funny, you no, know, maybe every country thinks this, but I always thought Tony was very Irish. I know he I know he doesn't have any Irish, just the, the way he kind of interacted with people and often there was a drink involved and he just mm-hmm. seemed like a very Irish type character. Mm-hmm. Well, he I mean he loved Ireland, he loved the Irish literary tradition. Uh, he returned many, many times for television. And I think, you know, he loved that storytelling tradition and the, the, you know, beautiful facility with the English language. I think he just felt as much as he didn't have any, uh, you know, personal ancestral connection to it. I think he did feel a deep sort of spiritual connection to Ireland and, and the Irish people that he met on his visits. And, you know, when I was listening to the book, something that came up, it, it reminded me of a wake, an Irish wake mm-hmm. where people were sitting around the table talking about the recently deceased yeah absolutely I think uh you know Tony was very unsentimental about death and uh was on record uh, if, if people saw the documentary film that came out about him this summer called Roadrunner uh you know one of the opening scenes is him talking very unsentimentally and very funny darkly funny about his thoughts about what should happen after death uh, but I do think that the form of an Irish wake uh, is, is an appropriate one for him. Uh, there was a, a um, private memorial in New York a few months after his death, and it really took that form. And we were in a, in a big room. There was lots to eat, lots to drink, of course. And, uh, you know, so uh, maybe 100 or fewer people, probably about 75 people, telling stories and telling jokes and sharing their memories and, you know, kind of helping each other uh, to laugh and remember the best parts of Tony through their stories. So yeah, this book is, is definitely a, a form of that as well. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not all fun and games. It's not all lighthearted. There are some, you know, dark uh, sort of difficult truths and some unflattering stories in there, but that is the kind of honesty that I think that Tony uh, would have wanted uh, to, uh, in in the retelling about himself too. He was unsparing uh, when talking about himself. He was honest. He was very upfront about his mistakes and his uh, cases of bad judgment. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted this book to be as honest and full a portrait as possible. And you really captured that, 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 you know, everyone is telling their stories. You know, some people are telling funny stories or, you know, stories that maybe don't reflect great, but they show his character. Because everybody, you know, I've read loads of articles and they talk about his complexity, but I do think everybody is like that. And I think this book shows mm-hmm. that everyone's got different sides to their character. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't think it's a form of disrespect to, to acknowledge that and to say, you know, he was not a saint. I mean, he was the, also the first person to say, I'm not a saint, I'm not a hero. I'm a writer, I'm a very lucky person. You know, I got a lucky break and I, and I ran with it. And, and uh, you know, it, some, some things got but hurt and broken along the way. So I think that is, for anyone, I think it, it is a form of re- respect to acknowledge the, the fullness of their humanity, the good and the bad. That's something that really shines through his, you know, about his feeling of being lucky. 
And, mm. you know, even that, you, you know, the guy that he was in Kenya with and, you know, when the cameras were turned off, he just said, yeah, I still can't believe I'm, I'm doing this. And that was mm. in his last season. So mm-hmm. he always felt like that, or maybe an imposter syndrome, syndrome too. That Absolutely. He, you know, yeah, that, that was definitely, definitely a part of his psychological profile was this, this sense that, uh, and I think this is, this is true of a lot of people in the spotlight where you can deliver the performance or the product that people want, you know, you can do a good job, but, but at heart, maybe you sort of can't believe that this is good enough for them or that they are paying their attention and their time and their money to uh, to you. Uh, and I think it speaks to kind of a fundamental uh, deep insecurity that maybe is something that that fuels the, the creative impulse and the, and the desire to perform. Uh, when I first realized that Tony had this imposter syndrome, I was very, very surprised. And, and then the more I learned about him, the more it really kind of made sense integrated into the totality of, of, of him and who he was. I think a lot of people who are, you know, artists say they don't want to stop because of that imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people in his position, they don't want to stop because or that fear the yeah. world to discover or not want sure. them anymore. Sure. And then also it becomes a case of, well, who am I? If I'm not beloved by the public, if I'm not you know, being recognized for the new uh, shows or books or whatever it is that I'm making, then then who am I really? What is my value to the world? Uh, of course, there are many of us that would argue that that he had a lot of value just by existing, by being a father and a friend and a a, a colleague in a in a small way. But uh, you know, I think it's it's a it's a real risk in these situations where you become a, a well known celebrity that it it it. It's hard to separate out your true self from that identity that's consumed by the public. Exactly. So if you could just let us know about yourself. So you, I mean, you know, you, you were his assistant was your title, but I like the phrase that he used for you, your lieutenant. He called you yeah. his lieutenant, didn't he? And that's more accurate. Yeah, you know, there were definitely aspects of my job that were uh, clerical or administrative. I, I did plenty of uh, travel reservations and doctor appointments and uh, grocery shopping and uh, you know scheduling the housekeeper all those kinds of things and and that was uh, you know that was something that was really important to him it was not rocket science as we say but it was uh, those are important details of of keeping a life together uh, so I was happy to do those things uh, fortunately Tony also recognized that I am a writer and that I was, you know, somebody who had worked as a writer and editor before I went to work for him and wanted to keep me engaged and keep me challenged and keep me moving forward professionally. So he was very generous in providing me a lot of other opportunities to to do that kind of work. Uh, When he established his book imprint in 2011, I started doing some line editing on some of the books that he published. And then uh, he gave me the opportunity to co-author a cookbook with him, and that's called Appetites. And we put that out in 2016. So that was an extraordinary opportunity for me and, and a lot of fun. And then uh, we were meant to, to write a second book together called World Travel, uh, which we started on in 2018. And unfortunately, didn't get too far into it before he died. And so I was left to, to finish it on my own with the help of some essays from uh, his brother and uh, some other people that he had met and worked with around the world uh, and, and a lot of help from his production company with a lot of the, the details of all the places in the world that he had been. Uh, so yeah, it was, um, you know, the job with Tony was never really a simple assistant job, uh, but, uh, but there, like I said, there was some aspect of it, but there was certainly a lot more, uh, you know, opportunity for growth and adventure. I did get to go on some travels with him, which was really just the opportunity of a lifetime. When did you start working with him first then? How many years were you working with him? Well, my first time working with Tony was actually uh, 20 years ago. It was in 2002. He had uh, been contracted to write his first cookbook, which was called Anthony Bourdain's Layout Cookbook. And he needed to hire someone to do uh, recipe testing and editing and, and sort of the, the nitty gritty of, of that work. Uh, so he hired me to do that. And that was a job I did with him for about 18 months. It wasn't a full-time job, but it was a project 
uh, basis. We've worked very well together on that and, and the book uh, did well and continues to do well. And then there were several years that went by where I worked as a magazine editor and as a writer and uh, did a lot of different jobs. And then I had a child uh, and reached out to him and a number of other people and said, I'm looking for part-time work. I'd like to have some kind of a job where I'm not obligated to be in an office uh, five days a week. And it just so happened that Tony was looking for a new assistant. And he asked me if that's something I'd be interested in. And uh, you know, I said, yes, right away. I just thought, you know, I, I wouldn't be anyone's assistant. I'm a little too old and experienced. But uh, for him, definitely, you know, I, I not no question in my mind. I knew it would be a great opportunity and that he would be a great boss. And so that was in 2009. And I stayed uh, with him up until the end of his life in 2018. And so that original time in 2002, Kitchen Confidential had just come out at that stage, hadn't it? So that That's was right. Kitchen of- Confidential was out for about two years. Uh, and then he wrote a, a book called A Cook's Tour that sort of followed his adventure, his first adventures in television. Uh, he wrote a, a slim volume called Typhoid Mary, which was about the um, the notorious cook, Mary Mallon, uh, who was Irish, yeah. <laughs> living in New York, uh, infected with typhoid and uh, sort of refused to be quarantined or isolated. Uh, many times escaped the, the clutches of the New York City Department of Health or whatever it was called back then. Uh, and it infected a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> and Tony had, as much as that was, you know, um, a destructive habit that she had. Tony had a sort of grudging admiration for her that she was just determined to continue working. She did not want to be, uh, you know, uh, isolated and, 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 uh, you know, she was kind of wily and, and, uh, mysterious. And so Tony wrote a book about her called Typhoid Mary. And then he had the, uh, the contract for the cookbook. So he was very, he was a very prolific author. People sometimes forget it was really his writing that was what catapulted him to early fame and, and got the attention of, of television producers. And he really never stopped writing all through uh, his, his long television career. So at that time, then, when, when you were working with him at the first time, that was mm-hmm. really when his fame was starting to, uh, to really grow, wasn't it? Yeah, he was still at, you know, a level, uh, a mid-level and uh, over the years, it just sort of grew and grew and grew exponentially. It really even changed quite a bit from 2009, uh, when I first started full time up until the end, uh, you know, his platform just grew and grew. Of course, media changed quite a bit in that time as well. So suddenly there were all of these different platforms on which uh, to promote and expose oneself. So, you know, the the uh, rise of social media, the rise of streaming video, all these things really just added to his visibility. So I really did get to sort of see him at many stages of, of uh, fame and success. Did you think he changed over that time? I think he changed in some ways, but I think fundamentally he stayed the same, uh, which is to say that he was a slightly socially awkward, kind of shy and self-effacing uh, person, a, a goofy guy uh, with a, sometimes a very adolescent sense of humor, which I, you know, personally love and, and just really resonated with me. Uh, I, I do think he became uh, in, in public and, and in his uh, on-screen persona, I think he did become much more confident and more worldly and more comfortable uh, being able to talk to strangers, being able to assess a situation. But of course, I think it would be true for anyone. The more you see, the more you travel, the more you learn from other people, the more kind of um, maybe not cynical, but perhaps hardened you get or, or, or the more kind of world weary and, and sad, frankly. You know, I think there's, a, there's so much beauty in the world and he was very enthusiastic about finding beauty and humor in, in even the most bleak situations. But I think it was also... Uh, a heavy burden to see all of the ways in which people are mistreated or suffer or, or are sort of disregarded by their governments or the military uh, of various countries. Uh, you know, there's a, there are a lot of um, very sad, very desperate stories that he, that he came across in his time uh, on television. And so I think that does, that can really erode the soul in a way you know it can make you feel uh 
maybe a little bit guilty about your own privilege and, and maybe just a little bit um, helpless. You know, how can, how can I as one person uh, possibly help people or how can I come into a situation that's very desperate say in, in Haiti in 2010 after their massive earthquake as an example how can I come in here with my cameras make television for my benefit and then get in a plane and go home to my you know clean running water and my secure home and my my income it's a very I think it's a I think it really does take a take a toll on a person true and there was another time he was in uh, Beirut I think it was wasn't it mm -hmm. you know when uh, there was a war started and That's yeah right. It, you know, so it can be very difficult, can't it? To... Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, some of that gets uh, discussed in the book as mm. well, uh, that there was just a they went to make a, a show about the sort of the new cultural uh, developments in Beirut and the new hopefulness and the new sort of uh, Western influences and, and the freedoms that young people were enjoying. And in the middle of that, there they there was a 10 day war with Israel and, uh, you know, they saw how quickly things can change, how some people's lives can be destroyed uh, for for no uh, fault of their own, just because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think it really it really changed his outlook on a lot of things. It also was uh, actually the the catalyst for a very happy development in his life. Uh, Tony had been and dating a woman, Atavia, back in New York, and they weren't terribly, terribly serious, but he was, you know, so shaken up by the events in Beirut that the, he came back and they decided to have a child and to get married and to, you know, seize the day and, and uh, you know, live, live for the moment. So it's uh, in some ways a, a happy thing, uh, you know, the birth of Tony's daughter came out of the tragedy that he saw in Beirut. And there are some of the people that really shine true in the book, like his daughter, Octavia, um, Nancy, particularly, I thought, and also Christopher, mm. you know, his brother. Yeah, absolutely. So Nancy Bourdain was Tony's first wife. She was his high school sweetheart. He graduated high school early in order to follow her to college. And they were married for 20 years, but they were together from the age of you know, 14, 15 years old. Uh, and she is a very, very private person. And I really hadn't had I had almost had almost no contact with her until after Tony's death. And I was very, uh, you know, did not, I did not expect that she would talk to me, but she did. And she talked to me a couple of times. She was extraordinarily generous with her time and her memories. And uh, she really adds a, a lot to the book. I and mean, she's a voice that we just haven't heard from before. So very, very lucky to, uh, to get her. Uh, and then Tony's brother, Christopher, uh, uh, also you know, hugely generous with his time. He also gave me access to the entire family photo archive. So there are some really extraordinary and adorable and funny uh, family photos in the book that, that Christopher uh, gave us uh, access to. And, and Christopher shines a lot of light on, on the family dynamics. And I think that also goes a long way toward explaining who Tony was as a person. Exactly. And I think, you know, even with Kitchen Confidential, say his own book, he just brushes on his early days. So that really shines true in this book. You get a great picture of his early years, which really shows his character, his relationship, his brother and his father and his mother. That really comes true. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky to speak with Tony's mother before she died, uh, Gladys Bourdain. She uh she was a very strong-willed, very opinionated woman. And uh, one of Tony's friends says in the book, uh, you know, Tony's father is where he got his sense of humor and Gladys, is, his mother, is where he got his snarl. And I think that's very, very accurate. You know, from all accounts, their father was a very uh, gentle, funny, easygoing, very, very smart, but very kind of just content to read books and listen to music and, and uh, you know, live a quiet life. And, uh, and Gladys uh, was, you know, extremely, also brilliantly smart, extremely opinionated, very ready to point out other people's uh, faults and flaws and mistakes. And, uh, and, you know, very, very rigid in some ways. So it's a really interesting combination that, that, that came together in, in Tony and Christopher. Yeah, and the, you know, Christopher, when he's talking about his mother, at the start, I kind of I, she he was kind of describing her as if she was like a housewife at home, and she actually was a very successful career person, wasn't she? So, 
Yes. No, she was in the New York Times, an editor in the New York Times. That's right. That's right. I do think that she followed initially. This was, of course, you know, her children were born in the 1950s and 60s. Mm-hmm. And I think she did follow that at the time. What was very normal was for the, the mother to stay home and raise the children. Uh, and then uh, once they got to be a little bit older and more independent, she did start to work more. And then she she did spend 25 years as a copy editor at the New York Times, which, as Christopher said, it was just the perfect job for her. You know, she's very persnickety about language, very, very smart and, and a brilliant writer and, you know, voracious reader, uh, fluent in French. She lived in, on, in France on and off for a while. Uh, so this was just the perfect job for her. And... Uh, she was very instrumental, really, in his career from the point of view of getting, you know, as a David Remnick, she she knew his wife and put the article in for that famous article, um, which led to Kitchen Confidential. So she was very instrumental, really, wasn't she? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, uh, you know, it was a series of, of you know, good, well-connected people and good luck and good timing and uh, you know, not, I'm not sure every adult man's mother would uh, would interfere in that way, but uh, it really it worked out so well. Tony had written this essay really just for the entertainment of himself and his friends and his his highest uh, sort of uh, ambition for this piece was to publish it in a free weekly newspaper in, in New York. Uh, he, he tried to sell it to one place, the Downtown Express. They didn't want it. He, he went to the New York press and uh, they, they said they wanted it and then they ultimately killed it. And, and Gladys, uh, just as a favor, asked her colleague to, to give it to her husband, who just happened to be the editor in chief of the, the New Yorker magazine. So it really was, uh, you know, if either one of those free weekly newspapers had had taken it, that might have been the end of the story. There may never have been a kitchen confidential because I don't I don't know that they had the same readership or cultural impact that the New Yorker, I'm, I'm sure they did not have the impact that the New Yorker magazine has. So it was just uh, a lot of a lot of really good luck and things just being timed exactly right. But also at what came out of the book, I think it shows is that Tony, he was very ambitious as well and a hard worker. Mm-hmm. So at the mm-hmm. time he was working on his writing as well as the cooking, you know, like he was work, he was ambitious to succeed in the writing. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And I think there was part of his polished public persona that he, he made it seem that this was just something he did for fun and really just to entertain his friends. But the truth was that he was he was very, very ambitious and focused uh, for a very long time. His his friend Joel Rose, who was a, you know, a good friend and a co-author and also something of a writing mentor, talked about how from the the mid 1980s, uh, Tony was sort of laying himself at Joel's feet and saying, you know, I want to be a writer, I want to be published. Uh, You know, can you help me? And um, I I think it makes it maybe a sexier, better story to just be very casual about it. But the truth is, this was something that he, this was a craft that he refined over, over many, many years. True. So did you find that then when you were working with him for the last 10 years, and did you get to go to travel with him while he was doing those shows, Parts Unknown? I did, not uh, not on a regular basis. Uh, you know, I was I sort of the holding down the fort in New York, and uh, you know, there were so many so many trips that they took. Uh, but I did uh, at a certain point, I started to go on one trip a year. He said, you know, choose any location from our shot, uh, you know, from our seasons list, and I'll pay for your expenses and you can just kind of come and see what we do, hang out, uh, you know, do your own thing. If you want to write a magazine story about the place where we're at, you can do that. Um, so it was this wonderful perk of the job. So I did uh, get to go to Japan twice. I went to Sri Lanka. I went to uh, the Philippines, um, Hong Kong and um, someplace else I'm blanking on right now. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a really uh, oh, in Vietnam. That was my first trip with Tony was was in Vietnam in 2014. So I just um, it was what a gift, you know, to be able just to see him at work, to see these places, to experience the food and the culture and the smells and the sounds was really, really special. Towards the end of the book, when you're talking about his last um, year or so, like it's it's you know, it's quite emotional. I must say for you, I must have found it very emotional. I found it very emotional. I had a friend who died by suicide. So I could really relate to those, everybody talking about 
the guilt or that feeling of, oh, if I could have talked to the person, I could have I could have done something or you know, even one of the directors say, blaming his gallbladder, joking, but not joking because, he, mm-hmm. you know, he wasn't directing in Hong Kong. So I could really relate to that, I have to say, you know. Yeah, it is. A, it is a very difficult aspect of, uh, you know, the grief of a, a round of suicide is that that second guessing and that wishing uh, that, you know, one could have had an opportunity, uh, you know, and the truth is a lot of us, you know, we knew that Tony was having a hard time that week. And there were any number of us who reached out and said, are you OK? Is there anything I can do? Please call me. Uh, you know, let's just, you know, know that 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 you are supported and loved. Uh, and unfortunately, it just it didn't change the decision that he made for himself. Uh, so it, I, I think it's very important for survivors of suicide to forgive themselves and to recognize and understand that this this was a decision that someone else made. This is a, you know, a, a mental health crisis that someone else was having. And, and unfortunately, we don't have control over those things and certainly not, um, you know, in retrospect, and it, but it is very, it is very hard. And these were conversations that, uh, that a lot of us had with each other for a long time about the last time we spoke with him, how we thought he was doing, you know, if only, if only, but, um, you know, unfortunately it's not, it's not the way things turned out. So I, I do hope that people reading this, especially if they've lost someone to suicide, um, you know, will will recognize themselves in it and, and be able to forgive themselves because it's unfortunately when somebody makes that decision, if if they're if they're determined to do it without detection, that's there's there's really nothing you can do, you know. You two have you two have a song called uh, Stuck in a Moment You Can't Get Out of. And it was about mm-hmm. Michael Hutchinson. And they were mm-hmm. there, you know, he was going if he just had 15 minutes because it can often be a spontaneous decision. And I, mm-hmm. that's the impression I get from the book as well, that people feel that it was kind of just a spontaneous decision. Yeah, he was very, very tired. It was at the end of the long, long season of shooting. Uh, he was having some uh, difficulties in his romantic life, for sure. Um, and when you're a you know very public figure attached to another very public figure, everything is is fodder for the tabloids so it's something amplified, that amplified isn't it it's yeah, amplified yeah something that might have been a private matter between a couple of of adults became uh you know a, a form of of cheap tabloid entertainment i think that aspect was very very difficult for him i think uh you know humiliation is a is in some ways worse than heartbreak you know uh and, and i think that he felt humiliated by what was going on uh and then just not having a, a great base of uh, strong mental health. Uh, he, he just, yeah, I, th- I think he made a, a very spontaneous decision. I think in some ways it was an aggressive decision. You know, I think it was, uh, it, it was, poten- I mean, this is all speculation, of course, but I think it, it may have been designed in a moment, in a, in a terrible moment to, to cause hurt to someone else. Um, you know, but all, we're just left with, what we know and 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 all we can really do is speculate and and uh you know try and look out for one another who are still here you know and make sure that this doesn't happen to to someone else and it's a very difficult uh situation to be in for do, for everyone do you, do you find that frustrating like people some people i say were coming to the book looking for answers you know about why he died and mm-hmm. do you find that hard or no, I think that's uh, that's a legitimate um, it's a legitimate inquiry, and I think I don't I don't think this book answers everything in a sort of tie it up in a neat bow mystery novel kind of way. But I think that uh, I think that it does answer questions. I think it does sort of um, show people a more complete picture of who he was, what his struggles were, what his uh, his extreme fragility and his weaknesses. And I think that uh, if you if you read the book, you will, I, I believe, have a greater understanding of how someone who seemed to have the perfect life could still get to a place where they feel uh, so desperate as to as to end that life. You know, like his Twitter handle, I think it's enthusiast is, is mm-hmm. what he calls himself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what really shines true. 
um, like actually during lockdown, when Ireland was in lockdown, I started watching Parts Unknown again to get my travel fix. And mm. they're such uplifting programs. And I think that comes true in the book as well. Behind everything, you know, he's a complex person, but really he's an uplifting, positive, curious person. And I think mm. that really shines true in the book. Absolutely. I mean, he could find the excitement and the romance and the drama in the most mundane things. I remember one of the last conversations I had with him, we were recording uh, for my podcast, actually, and he was talking rapturously about breakfast cereal. Uh, you know, he just was, he had just to sort of rediscover the childish pleasure of having a bunch of boxes of breakfast cereal to choose from every morning. And I think he had gotten a certain limited edition of a, of a cereal that, uh, crunch berries, maybe that was all berries or something silly. And he just, he was as enthusiastic about that breakfast cereal as he was about, you know, discovering um, the little bars uh, in Tokyo for the first time or flying to Antarctica. I mean, he just, he had this overarching, uh, you know, excitement and, and love of life, uh, you know, no matter what it was. So that really, um, that could be a really beautiful thing to witness. It was very, very, charismatic and compelling to be around you know it made you feel that and somebody says this in the book too he made things seem better than they were he made you excited about what you were all doing together you know he was very good at sort of uh manifesting that uh that enthusiasm for life exactly like you can see it say in parts unknown he brings out the best in his guests it's mm -hmm. that electric or even then even with food it's like it's not the fancy he always seems uncomfortable actually when he's having a fine dining experience mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. in a diet like there was one reason a diner and he's eating a burger and he's got a hot dog on ready to go and he, the smile on his face he looked like yeah. he was enjoying that more mm -hmm. yeah i think he just he liked he liked good food in any context but i think you'll see more and more throughout the years that fine dining sort of lost the excitement appeal for him uh, you know there's only so many ways you can have a, a foam or a very tortured little uh you know piece of pheasant wing uh, with a pickled something on it you know I, I think that uh that as as time went on he was more interested in the people in the food that that was accessible to more and more people you know that tasted delicious and cost two dollars uh you know versus yeah. something that was an extremely exclusive uh experience and you know you probably would have been in touch with him more than any other person in in the last few years so it must have felt uh, must have been lovely to be able to interview all those people i mean i didn't i assumed you would have known say christopher or nancy people like that but to get mm -hmm. to meet them and talk mm -hmm. to them it must have been lovely was it Absolutely. Yeah, it was so um, important in the grieving process to to talk to so many people who knew Tony, who loved him, who had great stories, who had insights and experiences, things I had never heard about, people I hadn't even heard of. Uh, you know, in a lot of in a lot of cases, one person led to the next person, led to the next person, and so there was a whole cohort of of men that he worked with in restaurants in the 1980s and 90s, and a few women. Uh, and so it was sort of like, I talked to one guy and he go, oh, you got to talk to my buddy, this guy. And then he would send me to the next guy. So it was, it was really, really, um, special. Not only, not only to talk to the people I hadn't met before, but even the people that I had good working relationships with, because we never really had the time or the inclination to sit down and really talk about Tony in a very true and honest and deep way. I, I think in part, because we all wanted to maintain some professionalism and some loyalty and, and, you know, you don't want to say too much about the boss and, you know, mm -hmm. so once he was gone and there was, you know, the stakes were different, it was, everyone could really open up and speak from the heart about their, their uh, impressions of him. And so that was very, uh, very useful to me. And, and a lot of people that I interviewed said to me as well, that it was cathartic in the extreme to, to have a, a structured way in which to sort of talk about Tony and process what had happened and the impact that he had had on their lives and their careers. It really is the, the definitive account. You really show, as I said, his complexity, but what a lovely person that he is. And I think I read an interview that you said, you know, you give anything to just have him back. If you were still around, I would gladly make any, you know, buy the movie tickets, get the, <laughs> whatever it is he needed. So unfortunately that's, that's not possible. So if I can, if I can help tell his story, that's, that's, 
the, the best second prize. Now our final guest is Irishman Paddy Daly who worked on many shows with Tony and he gives a great insight into what it was like to work with him on those shows and into the man himself. You worked with Anthony um, anytime he was in Ireland, basically. So, you know, what, what did you do with him? Like, how did that come about? So, so basically, um, I got contacted by Anthony's people in New York. Uh, we had, uh, they, they, I, I'm assuming they kind of reached out to a number of people. And then I, at, at shortly thereafter, happened to be in New York. And I called into the office to see them. And I spoke to them. And back then it was just, it was Lydia and Chris who were the, the, the main producers. The office was considerably smaller. It was a production company called 0.0. And um, yeah, I just went in and met them. And then afterwards, obviously on the back of that, then they kind of agreed that they'd like to work with me. And then, um, and then that was, that, that's pretty much it. And then in fairness to Anthony and Anthony's people, they were incredibly loyal that once they, they came to you and you had a good relationship with you. I mean, they've, uh, you know, they've come back to me multiple times with, with, with other programs since then. It was actually during lockdown. I remember I was, went through an Anthony Bourdain. I, I missed traveling. I was watching things for traveling. I w started watching everything that he did and I put on the Irish episode and there you are with him in the episode. So that was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, that was that, that was the layover. So so basically, yeah, no, I, that was quite funny because uh, he and I had worked together before, and um, and then again, I I suppose when he we there was, there was a script in place or a running order in place, and the idea was that Anthony was being picked up at the airport by a taxi driver. We got a taxi driver that was going to. There was a very typical Dublin taxi driver that was extremely talkative. Um, he was bringing him to the Grave Diggers pub. He was going to go in and have a pint in the Grave Diggers pub. And then alongside that, he was going to maybe eat some coddle and drink a few pints. That's essentially what we were proposing to do. And I think literally just he landed. He's in the taxi on the way in. And the next thing, the executive producer turns to me and said, oh, Paddy, Tony wants you on camera. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> Which I was completely unaware of um, uh, up to that point. And I think that you can't say no, because if you say no, you're be I mean, logistically for myself, it's more complicated. And then it's just, it's logistically for everybody else. So I kind of agreed to do that. And then I suppose we're in the Gravediggers pub and we're having a few pints and we're having some coddle and then we're having too many pints. Then you realize actually, hold on a second, maybe this is going to be seen somewhere. <laughs> so back on that. And um, and at the time as well, which was kind of, in, the thing is it was, this was all kind of pre kind of people being into Netflix and any of these shows going out. So I was always of the opinion, she just will never be seen anywhere. So I was kind of going, it'll be fine. And then, uh, so then the next morning, waking up with a hangover and kind of getting up to go to work, thinking shouldn't have done that, going out, meeting Anthony, we're going for breakfast. And suddenly Anthony says, you're in the scene again. So that was kind of how it started. Um, and, but I mean, eventually, in fairness to the executive producer kind of got involved at one stage then and said, okay, you need to give Paddy a break here, Anthony. Because between all of the kind of the drinking and the, the, the breakfast and everything else, like I was kind of on my mobile phone trying to sort other things out that were supposed to be happening for the rest of the day. So, um, yeah, so yes, but it was, but you know what? It was, it was, it, it's, at the time, it, it, it wasn't stressful. They were always... The interesting thing about that particular show was that I'm not necessarily thinking that you kind of thought you were working on something momentous, but it was always, they were always pleasant. There were long days, but they, the crew were always very, very nice. And, you know, Anthony was nice and they were, they were just, they were pleasant days. You know, sometimes I'd have to kind of pinch myself and say, this is work because we would go out and we would not, you know, we would go out and we'd work all day, but we'd, you know, we'd all go for a few drinks in the evening and it was all very, very pleasant. And it was all, you know, a very nice working environment. It was funny when I was watching it, you know, you could, you could actually see on your face, you know, the next day, the look of, oh my God, here we go again. That's what I loved about it because it looked like, you know, a regular, you know, people being out and the next day, one of the guys going, we're going to have a pint for, for breakfast as cure. And it, was that his style then? Or was, was it quite uh, improv in a way? Like, 
it was yeah it was all very kind of improv and, and I suppose that what what I was trying to think about this you know that the interesting thing about it was he he, he could be very quiet so you could sit in his company he could be very quiet but then I was trying to think about something when you and I spoke a few weeks ago just about this kind of potentially having a conversation I was thinking about it afterwards I was thinking he wasn't wasteful with words you know he tended to be you know when Anthony had something to say it tended to be something you know tended to be not necessarily something of great importance but but certainly when he was saying something he was there was a validity to it um he just didn't tend to do chit chat and I always felt that maybe when when I met him initially I think maybe as an Irish person that was kind of slightly disconcerting because you kind of those those silences could be initially were a little bit tricky you'd be like oh my god what's going on here but then you start to realize actually that he just didn't tend to do chit chat but if there was a subject came up like a movie or a book or anything like that he was all over it um and he loved conversation, but it, but there had to be, I suppose, there had to be a purpose to the conversation. He wasn't necessarily interested in talking about the weather. I get you. And you, you obviously know, got um, you obviously got on well with him because you know that's one thing you notice. His guests on the show are always people that he likes or gets on with. So you obviously had a good relationship with him. Yeah, I, th- I think. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, obviously, after working together with him a few times, yeah, we liked each other. I think. I certainly think I liked him anyway. Um, I, I, I said, I, th- I think what was what's tricky initially is in the initial stages of a show like that, the producers in America or wherever the show is being made, they send you lots of materials and you look at it. So I think I had this perception of him as being sort of extremely outgoing, the life and soul of the party. And so I think then when you meet somebody like that in a work context, you're 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 kind of maybe in a way you you expect that they're going to be like that. So that was my perception of him. When then in fact that is seven I met him, then initially he's quite shy. So I think I started off probably with the wrong perception of him. But when you start to settle back in and, and you start to become comfortable in the silences with him, like he was a nice guy and he was, you know, as I said, extremely easy to work with. The interesting thing is he had a genuine interest in people. I, I think it, what, what made him especially unique is he wasn't interested in promoting himself. I don't think it was ever about him. True. And that's, that's, that's a, a great skill. It was never about, you know, you find it all the time. You find presenters whereby the show becomes about them. Whereas the great skill that he had was it was never really about him. It was, I, I don't know if the word is vortex or whatever, but in a way... He simply was the vortex through it, which the You're kind right. of guests could almost talk to the, the audience. And he had this great ability because maybe he just, I don't know if it was because he was awkward or because of his shyness or because he was, he was genuine, but he certainly was in a great place that he connected with people from all walks of life. And he had this great, you know, and he was extremely, I think why somebody that came in is extremely unique is that he was incredibly bright, incredibly film literate you know extremely well read you know very art savvy just you know and and again that curiosity wasn't born from from the point of view of trying to impress people that was just something that was innate inside him he just he was curious for information in all facets of life really you know i was actually i said it to laurie who i've interviewed as well that um in a way, he seems quite Irish in a way, doesn't he? The way like that, you know, that that social, you know, because Irish people can be like that quiet, but when he's around people, you know, he's, he, you know what I mean? He's very social, even down no, to. No, you, you're right. Yeah, no, and I, I, it's funny actually because like the thing is, he, um, I never really thought about it like that, but yeah, he could be quite introspective like that. Um, mm-hmm. It is very much kind of an Irish quality, and um, and he absolutely loved the pub. And he loved the pub culture. Yeah, yeah. And he exactly. loved. Um, and what's kind of interesting, actually, was that in a way, outside of the cameras being on, actually, now when I think about it, like he was actually quite happy for people to sit back and tell stories. He didn't. He wasn't actually. Didn't necessarily. Even when the cameras were off, he didn't necessarily. I found he didn't have to be the center of attention. Um, which in some cases is a little bit unusual because sometimes that's what that type of personality or that when people present shows or actors, et cetera, and so forth, there can be that tendency that they want to be kind of 
at center of attention all the time. Whereas, you know, he was very comfortable to kind of sit back and just kind of, it was always, you know, in the aftermath, the cameras were off. It was just casual points then. And everybody on the crew was kind of equal and had their say. There wasn't a hierarchy, which actually was a nice thing about that job as well. There wasn't any kind of hierarchy that existed. The thing about Anthony was that he traveled with, um, with the crew. He didn't have, he didn't have a private car, a private driver, or he always traveled with the crew. And that's, and, and he was always, he very much always wanted to be, I suppose, part of that, as opposed to, you find it, I do see it a lot where. Um, and I, I, what I loved about the show is that um, often the interviews and was with, like you were in a chipper and you're in the grave diggers, you know, that it's around food. So it's relaxed when you're eating, you're kind of people relax, don't they? No, I, I, th- I think it is, and it wasn't, and I, and I know that, like, he kind of has spoken about that on a number of occasions, and it is, it's incredible, in fact, actually, and it's something which I kind of think, even from a work standpoint going forward, that I've always taken, I find that, you know, it's amazing how, when you do get people into a room, and you kind of sit people down, and you kind of actually say to people, you know, you put food in front of them, I don't, I don't know what happens, I don't know if people think, actually, if subconsciously we go home, or if we go somewhere else, but... I do feel that it's it's a great way of kind of letting people get the guard down. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, after kind of going back to revisit the shows that that he worked on, you take somebody like Barack Obama, et cetera, and so forth like that. There's just a very casual nature and and, and the conversation becomes quite casual. And I do feel like that. Um, you yeah, know, I think it's a great. Um, I think I've kind of heard the producers. Say, I, I don't know if they knew in the infancy of when they got Anthony Bourdain on, top, on board where this was going, you know. They kind of, I know that they, I've listened to interviews with them where they talked about, like, they themselves wondered where it was kind of going. It was interesting. It started off as a food show, but then really at the end of it, there's so much more than food. I mean, the food is very secondary. Like, I watch some of the shows and I kind of go, oh, you know, I'd love to go to Scotland for, and then sure, if I'm there, I'd love to go into that pub to have the food. But it's very much about the atmosphere and the people that he's spoken to and the types of people. He, he very much does capture an experience. Like I saw him like even going to the chipper that night. We went to the chip shop in Dublin. I mean, we just bumped into a few lads in the cobblestone pub. We started a conversation. They were great crack. And he was like, lads, come on down here with me. And he brought them into the chipper. And, oh, really? you know, that's at the time I didn't realize what we were doing. But now when I look back at it, I mean, it was very much like kind of capturing that moment. And we've all been there of that kind of night out on the beer with the lads. And exactly. And, whatever else, like. and, um, and it was lovely, you know. Exactly. And, you know, the thing that I was kind of surprised or didn't realise is only now after reading Laurie's book is how much he was involved. He, he, yeah, he was very involved from the point of view of, I, I think, at least my understanding would be, like, what I, what I know was that it would be, the, there would be a list of potential topics or a list of scenes would be written. But if there were things that Anthony didn't like, he was very comfortable saying, no, I think we'd strike that or you know, weigh in with an idea or, I mean, he had friends all over the world. So he was also very comfortable to kind of weigh in and say, guess what, we're going to London. We're going to talk to Mark Pierre White or we're going to talk to Fergus Henderson. He did weigh in, absolutely. We'd be trying to, you'd be trying to fill a schedule during a day and there were certain things that you'd write in and like he would go, no, actually, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. And by and large, actually, when you look back at them, you kind of go, actually, yeah, we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that because it's not really in keeping with him. There's somebody else doing a travel show or a, a show somewhere else that it's probably more not necessarily light entertainment, but mm. it's just a different type of show that that's more fitting to. But yeah, he he didn't, um, he did have a big involvement. And, and I always found that, like at least my experience of him with him in Ireland was that he was very knowledgeable about it. Um, he had taken the time to, you know, he, he just, he knew, he knew Dublin, he knew Dublin well, you know. I used to meet people after I worked on his show the first time and they would say to me, oh, I need to go to this restaurant in, um, in Hoth or I need to go here, or I need to go there. And I'd be like, why do you want to go there? And they'd say, well, oh, Anthony Bourdain went there. And I used to think, my God, is he really that big an influence? And that was in the, the early stages, the early 2000s. But, but, but now I find myself, like, if I go to New York tomorrow and if I find myself in Queens, I'm, chances are I'm going to try and eke out the place that he went to, just to have a look, because the probability is that we're good. And I, I know from kind of, um, I watched the program that he did on upstate New York and um, up by Hudson Valley, and I went to a place up there. 
I mean, I've been to lots of places that he has visited. You know, it's funny, actually, if I was going to a city in the morning, the probability is I'd have a look and see where he went. Funny, again, I was talking to Laurie about that because she was saying, you know, he might find this like shack in, I don't know, just say the south of France, that a street stall, but he'd know that by putting it on the show, it might change that stall forever, maybe even for the worse, because all of a sudden they get overrun. He, he was aware of that, you know. The producers of the show, um, they tried to do, I mean, they started off, I know there was the, the first programme show that he did, I can't recall the name, but then I know they went from that to No Reservations, and, in, and it was all in the title. I mean, it was literally sort of about the idea that you or I or anybody is in a city and they kind of, and it's that kind of, ca- and, and really, I suppose, you, that uh, to me is when you're really discovering the city is when we all, you know, we all come back from holidays and say, my God, I accidentally stumbled upon this place. Exactly. And it was amazing. Exactly. And I suppose what he did in a lot of ways was he helped you to accidentally stumble upon them. And, and do, uh, do, do you know, that's what I, I, I think his magic ingredient was, is his chemistry with people, like with, with the guests that he'd have on or the people that he'd be talking with. You could really see the chemistry. And that's what I loved watching. And as you said, the, if they were having a meal, the food was incidental, but it added to it. But it was the chemistry. And I think he, he had that with you as well. Like you could see, obviously, liked you. He had people he liked on, no matter who they were. You could see that, that it, that it was for him, it was all about that chemistry. Yeah, but it, it's, it's kind of interesting, actually, because I remember, it's funny enough, actually, um, watching a show that they, they shot in Sicily years prior. Like, and it, it, that's the interesting thing is, I think, well, I think it was a Sicilian show, but I always did think it was interesting, actually, because it was always actually quite funny as well when he didn't care for the person on the camera. <laughs> because you could kind of, like, you know, in a way, it worked better that way that there were times when you'd sit there and you'd kind of feel like that he maybe perhaps to use the Americanism, he felt that the person he was sitting across from was quite vanilla. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but at the same time, then there were, there were certain episodes I watched where you could actually kind of think he really didn't like certain people and you could almost detect that. And that was quite funny. Um, like, because on one particular episode, as I said, it was just like more when, um, there were certain things were due to happen in the show and then he would realize actually that you know that he was that whoever was telling this was going to happen or that was going to happen was really just spoofing and that really used to just drive and cracked i mean i think actually it's interesting actually he strived that the the show would be authentic so he hated the idea that you know for argument's sake he'd set something up like a fishing trip and you'd already have the fish on the line and you bring them in and go and that used to happen occasionally in various countries and the people that would be working alongside him and they'd be saying, oh no, we just caught this. The interesting thing is it wasn't so much that scene that you could see the frustration was, the reality of the situation is you knew that they had to shoot something else with that person the following day. So the following day, if you notice the chemistry, it's just like he has no interest in being there. Yeah. Because it, it kind of, it almost captures something kind of culturally. You know, it's interesting how you talked about it being like the, the food show and, 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 and you know, I, I suppose how it kind of organically developed. At the end of the, where they kind of arrived at with Parts Unknown, I mean, it was on a tra- trajectory of it. Um, I, I, I feel like that he was constantly evolving. And I would, I, you know, that's the, the unfortunate part is actually that it's just, it is unfortunate that we don't have him here today to see where it would have gone next. Yeah. I think actually as, a, as an interviewer, like that skill set that he had acquired over a number of years, he was only getting better. You know, he was very curious. He had a very good conscience. So it's unfortunate we didn't, we, we don't get the opportunity to see that. Exactly. Like that interview with uh, Barack Obama in Vietnam was just brilliant. It's probably one of the best interviews mm. with Barack Obama because you got to really yeah. see Barack Obama. You know, he kind of said to him, asked him about, does he do this often? And Obama is saying, you know, never. He needs like an entourage of people and the restaurant has to be closed to go to a restaurant. And then he started talking about Indonesia and being you know, eating over a stream and seeing the fish going underneath them. So you learned it was a brilliant interview, you know. Yeah, no, and that's that's the, that's what I kind of think. And, and I think like that, you know, he was somebody that like, you know, that there are lots of, you know, people across the globe that I, you know, heads of state and and various people that I would love to have seen him sit down with. And and because it's not often that somebody can make that transition from that world that he came from into the other world. It's just like that he was blessed with that intellect and that knowledge and that curiosity and, you know, so well read. And, and, and 
the interesting thing is like, you know, so well respected. I, I remember actually we brought him to Matt the Trashers in Dublin um, and he went in and he had a pint of Guinness there. And I remember thinking afterwards when Michelle Obama came to Ireland, she went to Matt the Trashers. I often wondered, was it because uh, the people done the research and was because of the Berdain thing? Wow. You know, and it wouldn't have surprised me. Yeah, sorry, but last, last question. So when he asked you that, like in the taxi, were you in shock, were you? About appearing on the show. Yeah. Was it, well, he got out of the taxi and then said, actually, do you know what? You can do this with me, Paddy. Was I in shock? Not really. I just remember thinking, like, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, you just kind of go, like, oh, geez, maybe I should have worn a different shirt. Maybe I should have done this. <laughs> it's yeah. this kind of nonsense. Like, that kicks in. Got the haircut. Um, yeah, because you're just, you're not even thinking like that. Um, but uh, was it a shock? No. I mean, you know, I, I had, I was familiar with the way in which he worked and it was a lot of it kind of was on the fly. And I, and I get it now because you, you see how it makes it so much easier when there are two people in a scene, you know, yeah. because, it, and the interesting thing is like, actually funny you say that now, because now when I think about it, like it, it really takes the spotlight off him as well. And it makes it about the venue and it does take the spotlight. And like when you have somebody kind of answering questions, you know, kind of, you could, they could have adopted another approach and he could have just walked into the, the grave diggers and said, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. And he could have stood there. True. Excuse me. And he could have spoken for a while. And then he could have spoken to Kieran, the owner of the, or the, the, one of the family members of the grave diggers pub. And, but, but, but I suppose by bringing somebody else in, whether it's me or anybody else in it, it does make it all very real. And, um, but it was, that was so funny because like that, you know, I presume, you know, the grave diggers pub in Dublin. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's so great because like, it doesn't matter who goes in there or what goes in there, like you know, you're they're going to slag you off, <laughs> and they're going to tell you this and tell you that and blah blah blah. But it's the best. I mean, it is the best kind of banter, and he absolutely loved that, you know. And actually, I will say one thing now that just kind of sprang to mind. I mean, I noticed in the aftermath of that. I mean, he was really good with his time because I know Kieran from the Grave Diggers uh, is a chef and brilliant chef, and Kieran was you know a huge fan of Anthony's and. Um, and Kieran, like you know, he he kind of in the aftermath of filming, he afforded time with Kieran. He was great. We all sat down with pints and everything like that, and that was quite lovely. But one of the other things that I always remember about him, and I thought like how he was so generous with his time in in a way, and I and it was probably actually Laurie that I reached out to now, come to think of it, that I hadn't didn't even realize it was her. But Fingal Ferguson that owns Goobin Cheese, his his mother Jana, the founder of Goobin Cheese had written a book, I think it was called The Farm. It was, being, it was about to be published in America and she needed to get um, um, a, a blurb on the back of the book. And her publisher had asked her, could she get a blurb? And Anthony Bourdain and my, myself and a group of us on, on a different show had traveled down to Goobine and had filmed there. So Fingal called me and asked me and said, look, is there any way that I write a blurb for my mother's book? And I said, sure, look, I'll ask. So I, rather than contact him directly, I just decided I better adhere to the correct protocol. So I went to the exec producer, I think, and they just said, look, you know, him. you can reach out to Laurie or reach out to his PA directly and just ask him. So I, that's what I did. But literally within the space of 24 hours, certainly within 24 hours, I got a reply. And the reply was, you know, if I die and I go to heaven and it looks like Goobin, I'll be a very happy man. Wow. And that was the blurb and that was the blurb they put in the back of the book. But I love the fact that, and I think it's a great thing, something we could all learn, but I, I, that's what, I, I mean, I don't know if Laurie would have concurred with this, but I always love the fact that, like, he was very much, like, if somebody asked him a question, or if there was a favor, or there was something needed to be done, he had a, he had that great ability of dealing with things there and then, as opposed to perhaps, like, oh, I'll put that on the long finger, or I'll do this, or I'll do that, because I know that I was in a car with him, and we were traveling somewhere and somebody called and it liked that it was somebody looking for a blurb or something on the back of the book. And like that, it was the publisher and he just said there and then he went, sure. And he just did it there and then, as opposed to, you know, where you work with people where they're going, give me 24 hours, give me 48 hours. He was very generous like that. And um, and he was very generous to the people of Goobin because he acknowledged that they were very good to him and very nice to him. So he was very quick to return that favor and generosity they had shown and kindness that they had shown to him you know 
that's the impression I got. Anybody that I've talked to that, that dealt with him have great affection for him. So I think you have great affection for him, don't you? Yeah, no, no, I do. I, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it's and as I said, probably the thing that 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 I would say is that I think I probably didn't recognize at the time what we were actually doing because now it's in retrospect when you look at the, the shows and when you look at especially the people in the aftermath that are trying to kind of imitate us yeah. and they just can't because and so it, it, and it and it and it really was you know without him lots of shows are formulaic and without the host you replace them but you know without him it's you know it's a bit like um you know Jeremy Clarkson you just there's there's one and that's it and you can't just replace them it's simple as that and and and, and I think he's certainly irreplaceable you know exactly I would like to thank Larry Patrick and Paddy for remembering and celebrating the life of Anthony Bourdain and giving us a great insight into the man himself I'd like to dedicate this episode to my great friend Louise who I was lucky to have spent time travelling with. If any of these issues we discussed today affect you, then it is always good to talk and there are numbers on the Samaritans website here if you need someone to talk to. Take care and safe travels. You're listening to Travel Tales with Fergal.